Hello and welcome to the big picture. The war of words between India and Pakistan has reached a crescendo following the attack at the Udi Arm base, army base, sorry, last week. While India has witnessed serious outrage among the people as well as in the media over the attack, the government has come under tremendous pressure to act. Meanwhile, Pakistan Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif used his address at the UN General Assembly last week to put forth the case of his own country and also blame India for the problems in Kashmir. His strongly worded speech was countered yesterday equally strongly by India's External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj at the UN General Assembly, putting the blame at the door of Pakistan for harboring and exporting terrorism. This war of words between the two countries is aimed at, the, aimed at appealing to the international community as much as it is aimed at the respective domestic audience. India, meanwhile, has launched a diplomatic offensive to isolate Pakistan. We will discuss today what this war of words means and what it would take to isolate Pakistan. To discuss this, I have with me Meera Shankar, former ambassador, Professor S.D. Muni, South Asia analyst and former professor at the JNU, M.K. Badrukumar, former ambassador, and Ashok Tendon, senior journalist. Welcome to all of you. Meera Shankar, so this uh, war of words which, is, which we have witnessed in the UN General Assembly, how effective is it? Well, it's a question of rhetoric. Um, and at the same time, you know, gathering moral support. Uh, you've got a large number of countries which have criticized the terrorist attack on Uri. Uh, but equally, you have also got advice to resolve issues with Pakistan through dialogue, uh, through bilateral dialogue. Uh, so at one level, it's good for India to put its case before the international community. But at another level, the question is, will the international community do something to address India's concerns? That is the question. Ashok Dendon, you have been watching this, uh, you know, this kind of thing for years from very close quarters in the PMO. Uh, how effective are these interventions at the UN General Assembly? I think they are very, very effective, as Meera is saying. See, the thing is, these days you can't do anything in isolation. You have to take the international community along. Now, uh, one factor which uh, I'm afraid is not being highlighted in the Indian media particularly is the internal situation in Pakistan. So, no, I, I, I would like Meera to throw some light on it and other panelists as well. See, the current army chief's term is coming to an end. And as we all know, when he came to become the army chief, he had a deal with Nawaz Sharif. Now, I think the, he is trying to precipitate things to provoke India into some retaliatory action so that he becomes indispensable and he continues in office. Now, this could be one of the reasons why from Patan Court onward, uh, things have escalated. So, therefore, we have to keep all these factors in mind without lowering our guard. So, therefore, diplomatic pressure is very important. If you ask me, during Kargil as well, uh, our diplomatic uh, pressure did work on superpowers as well. So, therefore, I think it is not mere rhetoric when we talk at the UN or otherwise. It does have an, an impact on the international community. And look at this. There is hardly any support coming to Pakistan. Even, even China, its support has, has not been very forthcoming in, in favor of Pakistan. So, therefore, I, 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 I think uh, the diplomatic pressure should continue along with a very effective measure on our border, uh, uh, literally a free hand to BSF to repulse any attack, be on guard, not allow any infiltration, and if that it takes place, uh, uh, deal it with very stern hands. Okay. Uh, so, Muni, what happens, you know, at the border, how how the, uh, you know, infiltration is taken care of is, is an another issue, is a separate issue. But we are looking at it, at, at a, you know, the diplomatic aspect of the whole thing. When we are saying that, you know, this... Uh, this kind of pressure, diplomatic pressure, needs to be kept up. Do we do we have it? Do we have some kind of an idea of what the outcome should be, or outcome is or should be? Well, the outcome idea, I think the government must be knowing better. But to my mind, it is to build pressure on Pakistan. 
to desist from uh, what we call the cross-border terrorism, which I don't think is going to work. Uh, I think uh, I agree with Mira that United Nations speeches are largely for record, that we state our position, this is what it is. This is a kind of a position which I think we and the Pakistanis have been repeatedly uh, reiterating. Uh, uh, the cross-border terrorism is not for the first time which has happened. The uh, state support to the uh, uh, terrorist groups or jihadi groups in Pakistan, which uh, Sushma ji very rightly underlined, is not for the first time we have mentioned. So we have been mentioning and I think as a diplomatic activity that may continue. What I want to draw your attention to is, and this is where I would like other uh, panelists to, to throw light on, that for the first time, India seems to have flagged vulnerabilities of Pakistan, internal and external. And, you know, talking about Balochistan, talking about Sindh, talking about Frontier Province, uh, mentioning uh, Indus Treaty, these are internal fault lines of Pakistan, which India so far has never aggressively uh, sought to exploit. For the first time, the government seem to have indicated that it is willing to explore the possibility of exploiting these fault lines. Now, there is a tremendous risk here. When you do that, either you consistently and in a very systematic manner pursue this policy, or if you are using only as a bargaining chip or, 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 or as a diplomatic ploy, then it will uh, cost you equally. I have absolutely no why doubt. Would you, why do you say that? No, because uh, like Parakram. I mean, that was the, that turned out to be, everybody thought that this is a real pressure which is being put on Pakistan. It turned out to be more, more of a diplomatic ploy. Many such things have happened. Now, so far as Mr. Tandon is saying the internal problems, this is not for the first time. General Musharraf and Nawaz Sharif had the same equation earlier when uh, Atalji went to Lahore and uh, Kargil happened. So, uh, Pakistan internal is what it is, we know. Now, what is it which we are going to do? I think to some extent I would accept and favor that the costs of Pakistan for continuing this, uh, you know, terrorism business must be raised, must be raised to the level of being unaffordable for Pakistan if we can. And for the first time we have flagged some of these uh, fault lines and weaknesses or vulnerabilities internally. But if we have just put it on the table and then we don't take it seriously, I'm afraid uh, that's not a very good commentary on an aspiring India. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bhadra Kumar, you know, raising the costs of supporting this kind of activity by Pakistan, what does it entail? What do you, I mean, what do you, what do we mean by raising the costs? See, raising the cost means uh, it's uh, not something, you know, which can be restricted to words alone. Uh, you will be, you should have the capacity to translate that onto the ground. Now, let's take item by item. Uh, Sindh, this is not the first time, incidentally, and Sindh was in a much worse situation in the early 90s. And uh, it is not as if India didn't have any contact with uh, MQM and other people. So this is not the first time. No, but we, we didn't the, raise it at an international level. We didn't make a so that's big issue out of it. What, what happens if you raise it? As you correctly asked earlier, what is the objective? The objective, if the objective is to compel Pakistan to see the light of reason and to become more amiable and to be a more responsible country. And to end then, this, then end, you end end this to, cross, cross then, you have to, then you have to inflict pain. And uh, it must come to a threshold where when you draw the balance sheet, uh, it's better to give up and uh, have a course correction. That realization must be there. So that means uh, inflicting pain at a very high threshold, the threshold is very high here. <coughs> and uh, you're talking about a country where uh, out of terrorism, it has suffered, it is suffering casualties which are not less than 10 times that India is suffering. So its uh, threshold is, you must realize, is pretty high. And therefore, when you speak about the capacity, let's get into the nitty gritty things. A speech in the United Nations, or a speech in, uh, on, on the ramparts of Red Fort is not going to impress the Pakistanis. 
you will have to subvert Balochistan. How do you do that? If you want to do that, then you will have to operate out of Afghanistan. Now, other people come into the picture immediately. Balochistan stability is very important for China, very important for Iran. And a certain amount of destabilization of Afghanistan will be necessary if you are going to operate from Afghan soil. Americans are not going to countenance that. They have their troops, Pentagon troops, plus the war contractors together. They have a presence of close to 40,000 American military personnel, trained personnel there, a full-fledged intelligence system there. Drone operations in Iran, everything is conducted out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan's stability is very important, which is why, in fact, four days after the Uri attack, they had this deal of for bringing in Hekmatyar. The big hand Pakistan is giving there. In fact, Pakistanis have played that card. A uh, couple of days before that, three Pakistani foreign secretaries who are close to the military we know, and one former national security advisor jointly wrote an essay in Dawn newspaper. And the argument is very clear there, that the thinking that is going on there is this, that from their point of view, the existential issue is the relationship with India, as they call the threat from India, of Indian aggression, whatever. And secondly, uh, a, a, a situation is getting ripe in Kashmir for a certain level of uh, engagement, diplomatically and politically on the part of Pakistan. And therefore they say that, you know, that let's not get into digression. Uh, this uh, nuisance called Taliban and all that, you know, let's cut all that out and focus on this because we need the Americans and the Kabul government on our side. And then immediately after that, this deal with Hekmatyar materialized. And when the, as soon as the deal was signed in Kabul, White House issued a statement welcoming it. That is almost a so part of the deal. Okay. So, you so are how do you subvert? How so do you use Afghanistan to subvert? Do, so you are yeah. saying that you know, there are these, all these complexities around other countries have their own interests as far as Pakistan is concerned. Ashok Tendon? You know, in this kind of a situation, what are the options that India has when we talk of isolating Pakistan? See, I do agree with you that most of the countries have their own interests. Even Americans do have their own interests. See, if I'm not wrong, the Americans have been referring to Pakistan as a state, I mean, sponsoring terrorism only when it hurts America. Or, for that matter, um, the Bin this is Laden after, issue. This is after finding Osama in, in Pakistan. Yes, but they do have sympathy for India because India is uh, facing terrorism. But we, we can't really rely on others for our own action. But for diplomatic pressure, we do need their support. And I think... No, when, we talk of, when we talk of inflicting, inflicting a certain amount of pain, how much, how far can we go? In, in this context, in the context in which Badr Kumar spoke, you know, and brought, brought to notice the various uh, actors in, in this. See, as far as covert operations are concerned, well, we are not specialists to discuss it, how India should be dealing with Balochistan or uh, uh, other areas. Uh, that is for, uh, you know, those who are involved in it. But the fact remains that uh, our threats, like... Uh, reviewing the Indo Water Treaty, Indus Water Treaty, etc., are also having an impact uh, as sort of a diplomatic pressure. Because once we go for it, there may be voices raised from different countries, how can India violate the treaty? So therefore, talking about it in a loud voice also has its impact on the public opinion in Pakistan as well as uh, the, the global opinion as well. So I personally feel that uh, the, the rhetoric of saying that we should go for a surgical uh, strikes, etc., all these are not our area of operation. For that, you have to give a free hand to the armed forces or for that matter to the BSF. But the government job mainly remained that on the diplomatic front, we continue to exert pressure on Pakistan so that, uh, you know, Nawaz Sharif tried to raise the Kashmir issue again, but he could hardly get any support. Even China did not support uh, Nawaz Sharif on the Kashmir issue. So this kind of isolation at the global level is equally effective, apart from, of course, what the government plans to do, either overt or covert operations. Oh, Mira, 
Well, I would cold, say... Cold operations we are not discussing. We no. cannot discuss that. Let me say that... If at least cold looking, operations we can't discuss. No, if you're looking at a range of choices, then you have to look at diplomatic pressure. It's not an either or. Either or. So you have to look at how do you exert diplomatic pressure, the maximum that you can bring to bear. What should be the end game of that diplomatic pressure? Can you achieve that? Combine it with economic pressure. After all, the debt rescheduling of Pakistan is coming up. Can that be a point of pressure? Will the international community so, sorry work to with sorry you? To intervene. And sorry finally, to intervene. you know, when you talk of isolation, mm -hmm. Is, is, is it a practical thing to expect some kind of an economic blockade on Pakistan from other no, countries? No, no. But you have the debt rescheduling talks coming up uh, and the international community has been waiving the debt or rolling it over. So that can become a negotiating pressure point if you have sufficient support, uh, which is a question mark. Uh, then you have the covert option, which requires strategic patience. It is not something, you know, which you talk about. It is not something which is going to deliver results today or tomorrow. But it's something which requires strategic patience. And you just look at, you know, the situation prior to 71 or even post 71, you had a decade of peace. Yes. Uh, and actually, as Badran said, Pakistan was on the defensive. You had the GSN movement, you had the, you know, Muhajirs, you had many movements and fault lines within Pakistan. And I think the leadership of Indira Gandhi was able to use that to put Pakistan on the defensive. What has happened in recent years is because of the nuclear deterrence that in, a, uh, in effect, uh, India has been put on the back foot and we keep reacting. We seem to be short of options. So I think we need to look at a range, a complex range of measures no, which but would what include about, all what, these. Sorry, what about uh, what Professor Muni was talk, uh, no, talking about? These bringing up these internal issues of Pakistan, what kind of a dividend are we ex can we expect? Not, I think, you know, if you bring them up without doing anything, it's... Uh, Any it's, homework? It's, it's actually counterproductive. So normally for such things, I, I, I don't think that we should be announcing it uh, uh, publicly and very loudly. I think these are things which you just do as a state. And you require, as I said, strategic patience and political consensus for it. Professor Muni. Well, I think there are many things which uh, seem to be, uh, uh, are being explored, I, I would say. Uh, I don't know to what extent it is correct. I heard that Islamabad has been converted into a non-family station. Right or wrong, I do not know. But this sends a message, if it is there. We are hearing in the air that uh, most few MFN... Uh, it sends a message to the, to the diplomatic community? To the Pakistanis and to the world. That, you know, the, 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 the relationship is getting colder than what it is. Uh, and uh, we again have in the air, I don't know whether it, is, it, it has happened or not, because no authentic information is available, of the MFN uh, is being withdrawn. Now, we, uh, Mr. Modi has had a talk uh, with his own aides and others on the industry treaty. Now, industry treaty government today, uh, till, till date, has not said that we are, we are violating uh, industry treaty. The discussion is focused on issues which we could do without violating the industry treaty. Without violating the industry treaty is using your, your uh, share of water which you have not been using. And if you start using it, it would affect the flow in one way or the other. And, and as uh, Mr. Tandon said earlier, internally there is a huge problem between Sindh and Punjab on the sharing of water. And therefore it would further complicate it and create pressures. So there are things like that. Now, I'm not going into what happens in Baluchistan or in Sindh or whatever else it is. But these are the things which start hurting Pakistan if you seriously and objectively pursue them. But as Meera said, as I said, as even Bhadran has said, if you're simply talking about them, it is meaningless. Okay. Because then it doesn't deliver anything. Okay, Mr. Bhadran Kumar, two, three things which have happened in the last few day, days are, is that the kind of pressure, one is the Indus Water Treaty, Balochistan, all these things. Indus Water Treaty, what is the, what is it that, you know, uh, we can do when, when you talk of violating the treaty, what is it that you can do in See, violating it? 
Abrogating the treaty. Abrogating the treaty, is, is, a, is there an option? A, it's not an option. It's not an option. It's an option because uh, there is a very big American role in this. And the World Bank, today, the World Bank role. World Bank, and actually it was it started by the U.S. administration. Right. And then it was transferred to the World Bank for putting it all together. And let's be very realistic about it, that you know that Americans have played a mediatory role in India-Pakistan tensions, and they still, even now, their pundits occasionally write about this, the Indus Waters Treaty as the finest moment of American mediation. So, you know, let's be realistic about it because any pressure, diplomatic pressure that you want to apply on Pakistan in today's circumstances, given the fact that, you know, our relationship with China is very poor, Russians don't have that kind of leverage over the Pakistanis. We have to come back to the What about the post, past post Uri attack? How, has the, how have all these countries reacted? Because the general feeling is that China, I Pakistan, will tell you how China, how, I'll America, tell you Iran, not all... A, not a single country. All, all have expressed sympathy for India. Neither China, nor Pakistan, nor United States, nor Russia has pointed a finger at Pakistan. No one has done it. They all have counseled that we should talk to each other and resolve the problems there. And while this is, while we are talking even now, there is the first ever Russian-Pakistani military exercise Exciting. taking place. Then... On the 19th, the day after URI attack took place, you know, we are so much involved in uh, all these kind of uh, things about war and peace and all that, we didn't even notice. Kerry had a very important meeting with Nawaz Sharif, and where he underscored, in fact, that they have a common position on Kashmir, which is this, that they, they viewed the URI attack against the backdrop of the upheaval in, in the Kashmir. valley. Now, you know, this is also the Chinese position. And then Radio Liberty, Voice of America, they have given very strong commentaries disapproving India's move on Balochistan. And they have said it that this is something which, you know, is going to affect international security. And after that, so, let, me, let me also say another thing. You just must listen to these things because our media is very inadequate. 20th, again Nawaz Sharif had another meeting which was with President Rouhani. And President Rouhani there mentioned that there is no contradiction between Chabahar and Gwadar, and China would actually like to be part of the China... Uh, Iran would, like, Iran to be would part. like to be part of the CPEC. Now, what does it mean? It's a clear warning to India to lay off because they have eastern province of Sistan, Baluchistan, which is already infested with terrorist attacks, you know, by, from organized by Saudi Arabia and other countries, and their base is the Pakistani province of Baluchistan. It's only in the last two, three years that Tehran has been able to get some kind of a positive response from Islamabad. So destabilizing uh, in any way. Okay. So the, the, these are the challenges. Ashok Tenten, these are the challenges which the economic, uh, which the diplomatic community, Indian diplomatic uh, efforts will face. So, you know, how, how do we face this? It's, it's very fine to, it is very fine to say it, to our own audience that, you know, we have done this, we have done that, but what is happening at the international level is something also which needs to be looked at very carefully. See, I agree with uh, my friend. The thing is, India is a responsible democracy. We are an emerging power. And it is our responsibility to ensure SARC is a success. And we have all the responsibilities in the world. So we have to behave and act in a responsible manner. That is the expectation of the international community from us. But our neighbor, he knows that if he, they keep pinpricking India, uh, through the uh, infiltration and terrorism, that India gets engaged in, with Pakistan, whereas India is looking forward to becoming a, a, a power, economic power, which has already become. So this is where Pakistan's strategy of guerrilla warfare or infiltration to keep India engaged in this uh, Indo-Pak, uh, um, this war of words or whatever you may call it. So it, it is a disadvantage to a country like India because we are seen and believed by the international community as a responsible nation and we have to act like that. So therefore, so see I, the so voices you, which are so emerging the, from certain quarters... So would you, is, say, no, would you say that our options are limited? Of course. This has been the position in the past as well. But when Kargil took place, well, it, we within restraint... Uh, taking the international community along, we won that war. So therefore, we should not be uh, disheartened that we can't do anything or we are not doing anything. I think uh, India, as, as, a, as a big nation, the largest democracy, 
and uh, emerging power looking for a permanent seat in the United Nations. We do have responsibilities. So therefore, any hasty action, I don't think, uh, will help us. So therefore, the first and foremost thing is the international pressure, which we are building, uh, I think, successfully. And, uh, and plus, our uh, guard uh, on the border, giving a free hand to BSF, and also keep the army in preparedness, but not falling prey to the trap being laid by Pakistan's existing army chief to provoke India into some kind of retaliatory action so that he can continue to be the army chief and keep Nawaz Sharif under his thumb. So that, that, that's an interesting uh, argument, which means that, you know, the, the, the same old theory that the civilian government in Pakistan has no control over what the army does that's in Pakistan. True. No, no, but I see, I only would say that you have to walk the talk. Otherwise, you should not have raised the talk. This is absolutely essential. But for walking the talk, I think one thing more important, which we have not brought in our discussion, that we have to address Kashmir problem. While Kashmir remains this, as it this is... This is what the international community keeps telling us. International community or no international community, you cannot deal with Pakistan unless you stabilize Kashmir, number one. Secondly, I, I mean, I have reservations on America not in our favor, China. Not. Well, in 1971, nobody was in our favor. But the situation got in a, in a manner that uh, we succeeded. Therefore, it is not something which is impossible. I mean, the countries would always look for their own interests and stakes. Chinese would always look for it. Americans would all... Let India decide what you want and whether you have the capability to carry it forward or not. Okay. Meera, how long can this standoff continue? Well, it's continuing right now, but I agree with Professor Muni that, you know, if you have limited options and your policy is going to be one of strategic restraint, then it's important not to let the level of rhetoric rise so high that it virtually becomes drumbeats. I mean, your rhetoric should not out, or your policy should not, A, outrun your capabilities. Capability. That is one thing. Okay. But the other is that you must be prepared to use your capabilities with a long-term plan. It's Absolutely. not something which but is But very quickly, last words. Uh, no, I, uh, the most important point is this, that, you but, know, no, that, no, the uh, most important point is, can, will we be able to isolate Pakistan internationally? No, we cannot. Because, you see, um, I can tell you in the early 90s, we had many trump cards. I mean, to put it paradoxically, the biggest trump card was that this was a Pakistan-supported uh, insurgency in Kashmir. We allowed the EU Troika ambassadors to visit. We organized yes. the visit. They Absolutely. went and saw it. Absolutely. Now, can we do that today? Okay. I think on that note, we need to end. It's a tricky issue. It's a... It's a complex issue. It's something which has to be all very experienced people sitting here giving you know their mind about how complex the issue is. I'm sure the government will understand it and we'll wait and watch how this will be tackled at the international level. Whether Pakistan will get isolated internationally is something we'll wait and watch. Thanks to all my guests. Please keep watching. We'll come back with Andarish in the big picture same time tomorrow.